Hello, so today we will be giving an overview of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's Invasive Species Program with a focus on the Japanese silkgrass identification and detection in Short Hill Provincial Park in the Niagara region. And we put this together um, to support the Short Hill Park staff and our partners in uh, Ontario Parks as well as any others uh, who may find this information useful. And we just want to thank the Invasive Species Centre for hosting and, and posting this um, webinar for us. So my name is Christina Tauk and I work in the Invasive Alien Species and Domestic Program section in Ottawa. And we develop and implement the Federal Invasive Plant Program for Canada. And my colleague, uh, Aaron Bullis appleton will be also providing information on the survey component of this presentation. And she works in the Plant Health Surveillance Unit for the Ontario region. So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, or CFIA, was established in April of 97. And we have um, a science-based regulatory agency that's mandated to safeguard Canada's food supply, animals, and plants, as well as the environment. And uh, we're divided up into four areas across Canada and 18 regions within those four areas. Our headquarters are in Ottawa, Ontario, and we have 14 federal acts on food safety, plant protection, and animal health. So we'll be focusing on the plant protection component today. So this slide just depicts the importance of plants and the reason for protecting our plant resource base. So as you know, plants provide us with many priceless benefits like oxygen and uh, green space and urban landscape, um, as well as the obvious uh, ornamentals and food and uh, medicine, animal feed, agriculture, um, food product, uh, wood products, and habitat for wildlife, biofuel. So as we all know that uh, plants really are the start of everything. So the CFIA's plant protection mandate, we have um, the Plant Protection Act and within that, the plant protection regulations. And these are put in place to protect Canada's agriculture and forestry sectors and natural resources from economic and environmental impact of introduced pests. So that's our, the, the, uh, those two, the, the act and the regulations are our main legislative authority. Um, so, one of the main goals is to prevent the, the uh, import, export, and spread of pests. And so we regulate import, export, and domestic movement um, of agriculture and forestry products, as well as other things, anything basically that can bring in a pest. Um, and this facilitates access to foreign markets as well from a phytosanitary perspective. The CFIA's Invasive Civilian Species Program contributes to the ongoing implementation of the National Invasive Alien Species Strategy for Canada, which was developed in 2004. So responding to invasive alien species, the focus of the CFIA is definitely prevention first and then detection and early response. Um, this has been shown to be the most effective and economical approach to reducing the spread of invasive alien species um, around the world. And so we, we definitely, as this arrow shows, focus on that prevention first before that curve can really creep up. So one of the main files for the invasive alien species and domestic program section at the CFIA is the invasive plant uh, file. So just like any other regulated pest, uh, pathogen or insect, they can present significant economic risks to producers and also the environment in general. Um, but specifically to the producers, there's an increase in production costs and then to the public in general or any landowner, uh, increased control costs 
and um, limited land use for property owners, loss of natural ecosystems, um, but also uh, loss of trade and potential impact on market access. So this is why also with invasive plants, prevention is key and we'd much rather prevent them uh, from being introduced uh, compared to dealing with them once they are here, ideally. So our National Invasive Plants Program was developed and implemented in the last 10 years, and it prevents and limits the introduction and spread of terrestrial plants that could threaten Canada's plant resource-based um, economy and environment. So we have um, the Invasive Plants Policy on our website and also the Directive B1201. Um, so within that directive, there's an appendix one at the end, and that lists the uh, 21 regulated plants under the Plant Protection Act. Uh, so that list is is a work in progress, and we are adding species as they become we become aware of them uh, through the test risk analysis process. And we focus on, as I mentioned, uh, prevention of species that are not yet present in Canada or present in a limited distribution. So um, any new, unusual or suspected detections of regulated invasive plants should be reported to the CFA as soon as possible. And then uh, based on the, the pest risk analysis process, they may be added to our regulated plant list under that directive E1201. And so these are listed on our website. And I'll just go to the next slide, which shows you a list of them. So there's the 21. And I just highlighted the Japanese silkgrass to show that that is one of our uh, regulated plants under the Plant Protection Act. Um, and just to make a note that this list changes as new species are added, so it should be checked regularly on our website. And at the end of the presentation, we have some links there that you can, um, a link to the, to the directive uh, D1201. And that should be checked uh, regularly, just as I mentioned, it, uh, changes on an ongoing basis. So here are the different forms of the plants regulated under the Plant Protection Act. So we have seven species of grasses, three species of climbing plants, three genera of parasitic plants, and then eight species of other herbaceous plants in that list. And I just mentioned that um, some of the species have asterisks next to them, and that's just the species that are included um, as our target survey species. So there you can see the asterisks of the ones that are our target species. And so these are the grass species, and you'll see Microsegium simimium is listed there, so Japanese silk grass. And those are the other species. I just wanted to highlight them, but they, we have much more information about each of these species on our website, um, fact sheets, and uh, an invasive plant field guide um, that will give you lots of photos and um, identification traits that are helpful if you want to see photos. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, we, we, we're just going to focus on Japanese silkgrass, but those other species um, have information on our website. And so these are the three uh, climbing plants that are regulated. Kudzu, Chinese yam, and mile minute weed. And then our three parasitic plants um, at the genus level, so Cuscuda, Orbanchi, and Striga. And lastly, the other herbaceous plants. So these, um, there's also a couple that are on the target survey list, but um, that's the complete list. So now the focus um, species for this presentation is uh, Japanese silk grass, as I mentioned, and it's a shade tolerant annual uh, grass that is commonly found in forests, wetlands, damp fields, trails, roadside ditches, 
so damp areas in general. And it's an annual, so it, its life, life cycle lasts one year and it grows from seed each year. And this is a photo. So as with all of our species, they, they um, pose a risk to our plant resource base. And the species, this is no different. It forms dense monospecific stands that outcompete uh, natural, or sorry, native vegetation and the natural ecosystems. Uh, reduces biodiversity by crowding out the native uh, woody species and has prolific seed production that can survive in the soil for years, displacing um, nesting sites for birds and wildlife in general. Also um, can affect the control costs and productivity losses for producers if it's found in agricultural fields. And just to note that it is considered one of the most damaging invasive species or invasive plant species in the United States. How it spreads, um, fruits and seeds are dis dispersed by water and can attach to clothing or, or animal fur, um, but also it can be in bird seed, soil, nursery stock, so those types of intentional imports. Um, it, can be, uh, it can be hidden within those intentional imports of hay, and then also equipment or, or vehicles that have muddy tires. Seasonal flooding and footwear even can be a means of dispersal. And as I said, the seeds can persist in the soil for as long as uh, five or I've even heard seven years. Um, so obviously those are difficult things to control. And um, in, in this site in particular, we know that there's a overpopulation of deer. So it's uh, definitely, being spread by animals and um, and, and those other uh, vectors. So what it looks like, um, and we have more information and photos in our um, in our field guide and also pe uh, test fact sheet. But uh, we'll just go over the general um, identification traits for the plant. So it can grow up to one meter tall. It has many plants and the leaf blades are thin, pale green and tapered at both ends. The uh, shiny midrib is considered, of the leaf is considered the most distinguishing factor or feature, sorry. And it's used to differentiate from um, quite a lot of lookalikes in early in the season. The stems are 40 to 120 centimeters long and one to one and a half millimeters thick. Uh, the lower portion of the plant is prostrate while the upper portions and flowering branches are erect. Its roots are at, um, it roots at its glabrous uh, nodes. Leaf sheaths are shorter than internodes. Inflorescence are terminal racemes and uh, three to nine millimeters in length. And there is a uh, purple coloration in the fall. So that allows for easy identification in the fall, although it's um, often too late to be treating at that point, but um, it does turn a purple color, which is quite easy to distinguish. And then a bit more specifics. Um, so the spikelets are sessile peli, pelia, pedicellate pairs. Um, pale green leaves have a shiny midriff, as I mentioned, and are four to nine centimeters long and five to 15 millimeters wide. Ligule is truncate shaped and uh, zero, or uh, yeah, 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 millimeters long covered with hairs. So um, and the photo at the bottom, you can see the margins are ciliate as well along the edges of the leaf. And um, as I mentioned, they're well adapted to low light conditions. So there are quite a few lookalikes of this plant and I found uh, this uh, link at the bottom, uh, this field guide that the U.S. put together was quite useful in showing photos of the lookalikes and being able to compare them. Um, but 
I think the two that um, are most often confused are the North American native white cut grass and also the deer tongue panic grass. Um, <clears throat> but the, the North American one uh, native cut, white cut grass, the leaves are longer and thinner than silk grass and are lacking that midrib um, stripe and the hairy nose as well. And they also have rhizomes and a panicle style in fluorescence. <clears throat> and then the deer tongue panic grass are hard to pull and the leaf base is often clasping around the stem. So those are just two examples, um, but uh, there's, there are quite a, quite a few other lookalikes and that link I found helpful. So um, as we uh, went over, the, this species is regulated under the Plant Protection Act in Canada and the import and domestic movement of it and its propagative parts is prohibited. So until 2019, we had no sites within Canada that we knew about. Um, it is native to Asia and it's, it's present and naturalized in, Eastern, in the Eastern US and continues to spread into the Northeast in the US. So as of um, 2020, we only have one population that's been reported in Southern Ontario. And um, now, uh, now Aaron will give a bit more information about the site itself. Thanks, Christina. So in 2019, uh, the CFI was contacted regarding a small population confirmed in the Niagara region of Southern Ontario um, at Short Hills Provincial Park. So when we have a suspect report provided to us from a partner or an external party, um, official samples are warranted for lab confirmation. So our staff followed up on this report, collected samples that were then submitted to our invasive or our plant lab for genotyping at our botany lab. Um, this species has not been reported in any other locations in Canada to date. So thankfully, we have a very supportive partnership with Ontario Parks, and they've been conducting a lot of monitoring activities and um, scouting within the park to help plot the extent of Japanese stilt grass within the park, um, as well as the level of infestation. So you can see um, there are quite extensive tracts of the plant in uh, the western portion of the park and their monitoring efforts are ongoing and will continue to populate this information at both the park level and then more extensively at the regional level, which I'll get into in a moment. So it's important to just refresh uh, the intent and the purpose of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's Plant Health Survey Program. Um, our annual program reflects uh, a cross-prioritization process that our unit conducts in accordance with the various commodity groups. So um, we work with the forestry section, horticulture, invasive plants that Christina is part of, as well as grains and oil seeds and potatoes to define a survey program that will help us gather data to support uh, regulatory functions. So this can be to support trade or pest-free claims for specific areas, uh, to detect and monitor known populations, such as those activities we'll be conducting for Japanese stilt grass, and furthermore, to inform control action. So that's a lot of the work that Ontario Parks is doing within the park. Um, our survey work helps to inform regulatory decisions and also um, aids in international reporting to support trade. So our 2020 Japanese stiltgrass survey plan um, is striving to detect uh, populations of Japanese stilt grass within the Niagara region and also determine the extent of that population with a lot of emphasis on high risk areas around the known population. So looking at potential spread out of the park and also ensure that that is the primary infestation in the region. We hope uh, to conduct some of this work in late spring or early summer to help inform uh, next steps and potential control options. Um, if the survey is 
conducted slightly later when the plant is at a more detectable stage with that distinct midrib or even that purple coloration as we move into early fall. Um, we can do that as well, but it would just be information gathering to inform control actions for next year. So we'll have to build in some flexibility with the goal to conduct those activities uh, sooner than later. So our current survey priorities for this plant will focus on areas where seeds may have been dispersed from the known infestation. Um, so this uh, park is surrounded by pastures and fields. So those will be assessed in proximity um, where contaminated soil or hay may have been moved. Um, this is also part of the Bruce Trail system. So our staff will focus on trails and recreational or naturalized tourist areas around the vicinity. Um, Additionally, parks, shaded roadside ditches, so some scouting activities will be warranted to identify some of those ideal locations. Although we know Japanese stiltgrass favors shaded areas, it is quite variable in the different habitats it infests. Um, so we'll also capture forests and woodlands as well as disturbed areas, particularly those with known deer populations. And that's one key piece of information for this site is there is a very large um, to the population within the park. And uh, so we have to take into account their foraging behaviors and how far they may uh, have the capacity to spread the seeds on fur. So our survey methodology for this plant will entail visual inspection within a 200 meter radius of our pre-selected sites. And as we've mentioned, we'll place a lot of emphasis on those ditches and wastelands around the site. So unmanaged areas that are not actively being mowed or managed, as well as areas with evidence of deer activity. So looking for tracks, deer traffic pathways, droppings, rub scrapes, as well as their bedding areas, because we do know that Japanese stilt grass is a very um, suitable bedding plant and also a preferred bedding plant for deer. Um, so we'll further extend into trail networks and roadsides. And to ensure that we're having um, a detailed look at the environment through, uh, within these locations, our staff will stop every 20 paces to look over the surrounding area for any signs of Japanese stilt grass as they move through uh, that radial boundary. Um, if suspect plants are detected outside the known distribution, um, we'll provide photos. So our partners can always submit photos and GPS readings um, for the CFI to then follow up and make an official determination if it's positive or negative for a regulated invasive plant. So like all uh, official survey activities, we need to take into account potential for spread and therefore adhere to strict biosecurity precautions. All boots and equipment that have come into contact with soil should be cleaned to remove that soil and potential plant residues. Um, the cleaning must be carried out before leaving the site, um, particularly if there will be any movement to other natural areas within the same day. Um, Lint rollers can be used to ensure clothing is free from seeds before leaving a site. And uh, this is an effective strategy just to ensure that there's no potential for spread through survey activity. So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency supports a lot of outreach to promote awareness, uh, fostering early detection and reporting. Um, we've developed fact sheets both um, independently in conjunction with some of our partners. And we also have a series of pest detection cards that are a really great tool to have in your back pocket um, while in the field. And we have a new one for Japanese stilt grass, highlighting some of the key distinguishing features. And we also have a series for other invasive plants such as kudzu. Um, we have a survey protocol and the survey protocol has been adapted for both use internally within the CFI as well as a guideline for partners if they're wishing to conduct survey activities uh, for this invasive plant. And we really encourage sharing that data. So if survey activities are being conducted in accordance with our protocols, that data is incredibly useful to share with us because then we can promote and report on our collective efforts to show that broad scale initiative um, and report to our partners that extensive work. It also helps foster a complementary approach where we collaborate and kind of divide and conquer. 
Um, Christina mentioned our invasive plant field guide, which is a tremendous resource with a lot of visual um, and distinguishing features. A risk management document is available on our website as well as media lines. Um, signage on sites uh, can also be adapted from our pest cards. These can be printed full scale and posted uh, to promote awareness. Um, Provincial Parks has created some website alerts as well to support early detection and reporting. And then furthermore, there is the EdMaps reporting tool. Japanese stilt grass is within that platform, so any engaged citizen scientists are able to make real-time reports if they suspect the plant in their area. There are a number of resources and tools that may be referenced uh, to enhance your knowledge base on this invasive plant as well as others. There are plant species risk assessments, invasive plant uh, weed seeds fact sheets, risk management documents, a series of plant health directives that prov provide the guidelines to support the regulations. Uh, we have the list of pests regulated by Canada and as Christina mentioned this is an important thing to reference on a regular basis to ensure that your knowledge is current. Uh, the Plant Protection Act is um, the legislative authority that provides us um, with the capacity to take action and survey for various pests. Um, our automated import reference system, or AIRS, can be accessed uh, for determining import requirements. Um, and then our partners also have a number of resources that can be referenced and shared among collaborators. So if there are questions, comments, or potential for discussion, um, we're always here to support your needs. Um, both the Invasive Alien Species Domestic Program group that Christina is part of, um, any reports of suspected regulated invasive plants can be uh, reported to your local CFIA office. Um, as I mentioned, the Plant Health Surveillance Unit is always looking for survey data to promote our collective efforts. And then um, to stay actively engaged, you can sign up for invasive species listservs on our website. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for their time and attention and interest in this file, as well as other invasive uh, alien species files that we oversee. And I'd like to thank the Invasive Species Center for uh, continuing to be a supportive partner in our efforts. Thank you.